Welcome to Immigration Uncovered, the DocketWise video podcast where we dive deep into the dynamic world of immigration law, exploring all angles, practice management, law and policy, and the transformative impact of legal technology. I'm James Pittman. This is episode 30, and we're really happy to uh, achieve this milestone, 30 episodes of this podcast and going very strong. Um, and today we're going to be talking about immigration from Turkey to the United States. So we're going to spotlight on Turkish immigration. And it, this is going to be the first of a few episodes where we just spotlight a particular country and examine patterns and trends of immigration from that country. And for today's episode, I'm joined by attorney Emine Shahin Karakashwaolu. And she is a, an attorney licensed both in New York and in Turkey. And uh, she is joining us today. Emine, welcome. Thanks, James. Thanks for having me. Okay. So can you share with us some insights into current trends regarding immigration of Turkish citizens into the United States, what their interest level is like, and who do you see coming here? Sure. Turkish people, they're still interested in coming to the United States a lot. It, it's still very really trending. And when we check the data, we see that, you know, most of the people applying for the visas, it, the most uh, applied visa from Turkey is actually the tourist visa. Maybe it's not surprisingly because they want to see their options first. And approximately in a month, almost 8,000 people applying for tourist visa. And in the second uh, trending visa in Turkey is the J-1 visa, which allows, you know, individuals come to the United States, study and work. You know, it's also known for work and travel visa. And the third one is the third uh, very trending visa type is the student visa, which allows uh, applicants, you know, come to the United States and attend the, attend the schools. And most of them also, they are later in there finding uh, some employers uh, who is willing to sponsor for them. And the fourth, the fourth one is the investor's visa, which is very, very popular, especially the E2, the investor's visas are very popular in Turkey. And the, the last one is H-1Bs, which allows, you know, employers to bring some professionals to the United States uh, temporarily uh, for in some certain areas with, you know, some with some degrees. And but these are the uh, five main uh, visa types for the Turkish uh, citizens that they, they are very popular. All right. Let's talk about the J-1 visa applicants. Um, so J-1 visa is used in a lot of circumstances where... Um, you know, people want to gain uh, advanced training. It's it's used sometimes by medical residents uh, and um, academicians uh, and others. So, who, what sort of industries or professions have you seen utilizing the J one? Actually, it is like almost all from like all all different from different fields, and as you say, from medical students and also even sometimes for like for very basic mechanical jobs, even they are applying for it. So it is not just for uh, some degrees or uh, you can even apply for with studies, in not even with bachelors. The only downside for the J-1 is sometimes there are uh, requirements for like two years residency requirement, which means that when the visa is finishing, you have to come, you have to back to your country and stay two years at least two years to do anything else. If you want to come again, then you have to wait two years. But there's also another option for that. There's some, you know, waiver options. Sometimes we can waive these uh, times as well in the States so they don't have to leave. Okay. And about the F1 students now, do you see mostly undergrads or are you seeing, I, I, I'm sure you see them at all levels, but where are the bulk of those? Are they in my experience, they I have, um, it's usually actually after the graduation, like after grads, usually like the MBAs and, and most of, I don't know why, but most of them also like engineers, uh, most of the engineers and also some, you know, people who wants to work for uh, Silicon Valley for later. Actually, it's very popular also for them as well. Okay. And the H-1Bs, is that also the same profile, a lot of people in tech or... Yes, same. So especially for the engineers as well, it's the same. And for the H1 also, you, uh, the minimum degree is the bachelor. So we see the, you know, people they are applying, at least because they need to have a bachelor's degree, but some of them also already have advanced degrees as well. Okay. 
And you mentioned your last category that you mentioned were the investors. So let's talk about what are some of the common reasons motivating Turkish entrepreneurs and business people to seek immigration to the United States? I think, first of all, economic situations in Turkey and also in general economic situations in the world. For example, in the past, people, they were uh, they in, from Turkey, they were uh, they, their urge was, you know, invest to the Europe, European countries, you know, in the past, because it's very close to the United States, I mean, Turkey. And also it is, um, they also had like beautiful agreements with Turkey. So for the investors, it was easy to invest to the Europe in the past. But nowadays the trend is changed because um, the economic situation, you know, after the COVID, it's not really uh, also good in Europe as well. So because of that, and also I believe also because of some, you know, political reasons, now uh, most of the investors, they want to come to the United States. Because also another reason, Turkish government also giving some like grants or like incentives for the Turkish investors. Sometimes it is like the rent, a grant for up to four years. So it is huge. Like it is very important for them. And also I believe after the online sales, some of the um, people, you know, the traders, they are already eligible to apply this type of visas, like even without invest any more money. There's two different categories in uh, investors visa and some of them is already eligible as a trader so they don't have to invest anymore so i think because of that more i think nowadays is more and more turkish investors also coming to the united states everything you're talking about right now we're talking specifically about the e visa are you also mentioning e-visa. right now the eb5 or no, just e visa but under e visa there is um, there are two different categories. So one of them is E1, the other one is E2. E1 is for the traders, and with E1 you don't have to uh, invest any money. You don't even have to a company in Turkey, but you need international trade between Turkey and United States. And this tra- international trade, if you have also like if you are trading with other countries as well, but at least fifty percent of all of this trade has to be with Turkey. So if you have some, you know, if you are bringing some, for example, I don't know, headphones from Turkey, and but if it is not just like one transaction job in a year, if you are, if it is like continuing transaction and also the trade volume is high enough, then the um, the you know the person who has a company in the states can apply for this E one visa. So they don't have to invest any money, but under E two. Uh, first of all, they have to bring some money f- from Turkey, like uh, legitimately clean money from Turkey. The source of money have to be clean. And but it, luckily, there's not any uh, set number of amount in the manual. So ev- in every case, the officer or uh, you know the United, I mean USCIS or the consulate officer, they are checking every case separately. Sometimes fifty thousand dollars might be enough, but sometimes one million dollar might not be enough. So the for the E2, you have to bring some, you know, uh, money to the United States and then you have to purchase a company. It might be someone, someone else's company or you can establish your own company. And then, of course, the company has to run and at least bring some money to enough for the investor and their family. And plus also for the future, create US jobs as well. And our audience will be familiar, I mean, uh, with this category, but uh, basically the amount of funds for the E2 category just depends on the type of, it, it depends on the type of business that you're doing. And it has to be sort of commensurate with your business plan. You would come up with a business Definitely. plan and it has to be, uh, the company has to be profitable to a greater degree than just simply surviving. Like it's yep, not in correct. And uh, so if it's going to be, uh, you know, um, something which does not require a lot of capital at, at, at the outset, like someone wants to do small, let's say, graphic design firm yeah. or marketing firm, that's one thing. But if the plan is to open like a restaurant and nightclub with a facility, yeah. that's going to require much more capital. Definitely correct. If it is a, like a hairdresser, technically hairdresser is bringing his own skills to the business so it means that they only need like minimum um, equipment to just to you know open it because technically their knowledge is their investment 
their skill is their investment, correct. And what about the EB-5 category? Have you uh, dealt with uh, those who are... Not to... yet, not yet, because right now in Turkey, um, you know, the dollar and the Turkish lira, one dollar is almost 32 Turkish liras right now. And I think, I am not sure if I will even have a chance to work on an EB-5 uh, right now, with nowadays, you know, with this... Um, situation but uh yeah it's also another investment uh option for the you know like big investors this one is for small small scale investors the e2 and e1 but eb5 is for uh, because you know the requirements are completely different you know it has so i don't have any experience on eb5 okay um but and you mentioned that the turkish government does provide grants for entrepreneurs yes. um are they allowed to use those funds to to come to the United States and start the business? Technically, no. So, yeah, technically, so they can do it. But the thing is, the uh, Turkish government is giving these uh, grants to the Turkish company, not to the U.S. company. So, but U.S. company, of course, a, I mean, a Turkish company can buy a shares of a U.S. company or they can establish a company. But when they grant the funds, they are granting to the Turkish company. Technically, it is the same company. It is not like a huge uh, deal. But for E2 purposes, we cannot use as a source of investment. Because it is a, you know, it is grant. It, it is not the same thing. So they can use it as part of their rent and maybe for later, but not for the E2 purposes. And how do you approach uh, drafting the business plan? Uh, do you participate in that or do you prefer to outsource that job or do you rely on the client to really? Yeah, I'm outsourcing. I am working with two different companies. One of them is a, a you know, a Turkish speaking uh, person also, she established. And also the other one is also one of the like most famous business plan company in the United States. So uh, I believe it is like more, more, a very technical and very important part of the E2 application. And because of that, I want, if it is possible, I want client to work with a professional company. And if it is possible, I want to work, you know, with the people that I already know, the company I already know, because we all, I already know their style, because it is also important to understand, um, you know, the topics that they need to mention in the business plan. Because it is not a business plan for to get a loan. It, it is a not, not the same thing. It is not a, a simple, because they also even need to explain the source of money as well. So it is like, it is a teamwork for us. So I definitely prefer to work with professional business plan companies. Okay, now let's um, talk about the Turkish professionals coming, like let's say academicians or other professionals. I mean, what are some of the main drivers for seeking immigration to the U.S.? Uh, if somebody's like a new, let's say, new PhD or a new engineer, you know, what's what's the motivation for wanting to come here versus look for a job in Turkey? I mean, mm -hmm. how how is the economy in a lot of fields in Turkey right now? I think the first of all, the career opportunities is better in the United States, and especially for some of the fields like. It is the United States is the lead country for some of these fields. So first of all, I believe it's um, for a better career opportunities. And the secondly, as you say, also to you know to live a better life, like for a quality life. They wanna, uh, they also wanna bring their family, and they wanna, they want to uh, get their children, uh, you know, educated in the. United States schools, like maybe um, some of them also eligible for government schools as well. So I think, but the main focus, I believe, is the better options, like better economic and career options for the uh, for these people. Um, are there any particular challenges or practical obstacles that you see Turkish immigrants facing when applying for visas to come to the U.S., which might be, you know, sort of different to uh, challenges faced by applicants from other countries? Uh, yes, I believe so. I think it's a very good question, by the way. Yeah. So, for example, if uh, if you are from Europe, some of the European countries, they are eligible. They are already eligible for visa waivers. They don't have to go to the consulate to get a visa. It is like a Canadian visa. So it is like um, electronic visa and they can come here, stay 90 days. 
But for Turkish nationals, even just get a, a, a tourist visa right now, it's almost like more than a year. If you want, right now, if you will try to get an interview, they will give up maybe, I don't know, like two years later. It is that bad. The first of all, you know, it is very hard to find a date, even a date. And also, it is hard to get a visa right now, even just for the tourist visa. I believe the reason is, you know, the increased scrutiny, because they are thinking, even just for the tourists, they are thinking they will go and they will not come back. And because of that, they are asking like more proof or intent, intent to return. It, you know, I saw some denials even for business people. Like they, they are in the business for, I don't know, for 30 years, they have money and they, you know, have um, in the past different travels, visas, even for them it is very hard. And I believe the last reason also for that, you know, they are now it is uh, more hard to get the visa. Uh, also, the people there who cross the, you know, crossing the border without a visa, it is also now the numbers are very high also for Turkish citizens as well. I think it's also another reason. So because of that, I think, so in the past, it wasn't like that because it was easy to get a tourist visa. Now, because the, when people see, you know, two years and more, they don't even want to try their chances. I, you know, I met someone, it was a prospect. He was already eligible for a trader visa. <laughs> and I was like, why you, you did that? Because now we can't do anything. Like, And you already have a business here. Now, because I think people, they are scared that they are thinking there's any chance for them to get the visa. That's interesting. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Um, have, you, have there been any, I mean, you, you do a lot of work with the, e, the E1 and the E2 mm -hmm. visa. Yourself actually came to the U.S. on an E2 visa, correct? Yeah, yep, okay. correct. Talk about that in a minute, but I mean, in terms of those e visas, um, have you have there been any cases? Obviously, whatever you can tell us about uh, instances where you had to turn people down, you didn't think they had a good case, or you think people are think that they can get the visa, but what they're proposing just wouldn't meet the requirements. Mm -hmm. And I, I, some of the you know the prospect. I think it they were it was not like a bad case, but they were not ready to file right away at the same moment because sometimes they are applying like when they you know um, try to reach me for a consultation. I'm like most of them are good cases, but the problem is for, especially for the E E one a trader visa. They, they are thinking, for example, in a year they did. Uh, sales with the United States, my, one million dollar, but they only did in a one transaction. So it, it is not a, a trade that you know the manual is looking for. So I am I had to turn down and I have to say you know you have to come maybe six months later and I want to see like different transactions because they want to see also for the future it will be a continuous transactions as well. So or the, most of the problems we are having with these E two cases is. Some of them transferring the, the funds without even consulting an attorney. And sometimes it is very hard to explain the source of the money. So it is also another obstacle, you know, with the investors. And But nowadays, I think because of all these social media videos and everything, now they're more educated and they don't do anything before consulting an immigration attorney. But also in the past, it was very... You know, I was seeing it a lot, you know, people, they are just transferring the money and they're, they are thinking, oh, it's my money. So I earn it. But OK, but still, you know, you just transferred, for example, $200,000 in a one night. So poof, just one night. So it doesn't mean that is, you know, the source of the money is clear. It's it's not something that we can explain. Let's talk about that. Um, let's talk about um the requ the requirement that obviously the money come from a legal source. I mean, how do you document that, and what uh, is this? What is the embassy or consulate looking for in terms of making sure that the money was obtained legitimate legitimately? Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm very lucky because I was an attorney in Turkey as well, and also I did you know I, I came here also with an E2 visa. Because of that, I I know the the documentations very well. For example, for if you are selling a house in Turkey, I know the, exactly the process and what proof we need from, you know, from the uh, client. And also if they, you know, sell a car or, you know, it is it is very easy for me 
to uh, lead them, you know, to ask them, you know, to bring the, some documents. But uh, for the consulate, for the source of the money, as an attorney, we have to prepare, you know, a package like very detailed because it is one of the most um, important part of the application. They want to, you know, the consulate and the USCIS wants to be, you know, sure that this is a, uh, this is from a legitimate source. So I am um, preparing a whole explanation. Sometimes it is just, you know, this part is 200 pages because some of these, yeah, because some of these uh, companies, they have like a lot of transactions and so they are sending the money in not just one transaction. And every time, for example, one source is the uh, sell of, uh, they sold their house and the other part is from the business. So sometimes it is like very complicated. All right. Well, tell us about, let, let's uh, take a, a minute to talk about your own personal journey as an E2 visa holder. Mm -hmm. Tell us your story about how, how, mm -hmm. how it came about. I mean, you, you went to law school first in Turkey, I think mm -hmm. it was at Getty Tepe University. Yep. Correct. Okay. Tell us yeah. the story. Yeah, sure. So when I was at Yedi Tepe University, before all of this uh, journey, so in 2007, I came to the United States. I came uh, to the United States for a summer school in um, at Stony Brook University. And, and uh, at that summer, you know, I was planning to come back. And after that, in 2015, my husband and me, we decided to move to the United States. So before that, I graduated and I, I started my own practice in Turkey and I worked as an attorney for five years because it was something that also I want to do in my lab because I was thinking if I will come here directly, you know, to the United States without practicing in Turkey, I was thinking I might miss a chance or I might, you know, it, it, it might be always a question marks for me. What would happen if I stay in Turkey? So I just want to deal with it first. So I, I worked as an attorney for five years and then my husband and me, so we were looking for our options. And so we saw that, you know, investor's visa is the best for us because we realized that, like, if we will get the visa under my husband's name, I can attend school as a derivative E2 holder. So because of that, uh, my husband was the uh, main applicant. Uh, I was, uh, you know, the derivative. And after that, um, I started to work for a law firm here, and later uh, I tried to do my LLM, my de master's degree uh, at Toro Law School. So I graduated, and at the same time I, I was still working for a law firm as a paralegal. I uh, total I worked for five years, and then I passed the bar exam, and now I'm here, so I opened my own practice couple of questions. What was, the, what was the business your husband established to come here as an investor? It is also really interesting because he was a, uh, he is actually a, a computer programmer, but also he was an investor when he was in Turkey as well. So he had his own PVC um, producing factory. It was a, like a very big facility. So, but after that, so we decided to purchase a Turkish restaurant. So wait, so, PVC, uh, PVC polyvinyl chloride? Yeah, it is the plastic, you know, the yeah, PVC. Plastic, I mean, yeah. Pipe and things yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah, correct. I just want to make sure that I, I understood yeah. that. Sure. Yeah, yeah, correct. So yeah, after that, so um, he was already also, he, he also had a restaurant before in Turkey. But um, so we decided to buy a, a Turkish restaurant here. And then we applied for E2 and... You know, it was good. We we got our visa, and then yeah. So what's it? So tell us a little bit about the differences between law school in the U.S. and and in Turkey and the the the legal profession. I mean, here we have you know a lot of small firms, but we also have many large firms that kind of you know handle work for companies and things. Is it the same there? Yeah, it's definitely the same, but also it is. I believe it is also more um, popular for the new attorneys to start their own practice. Here, I think it is kind of like harder to start, but in Turkey, it is easier because um, there are also some, uh, you know, the opportunities for young attorneys, which is providing by Istanbul Bar. So it is kind of like easier, but here, I believe it is not that easy. But maybe with now, with the virtual office and with the maybe social media now, it is getting easier here as well. 
But in Turkey, it is almost the same. Like we have uh, some people, you know, some professionals, they are only doing their own practice. They are working as solo attorneys or small practitioners and also like very huge, very big firms as well. And but Turkey is a civil law country. Yes, correct. Uh, yeah. a totally different. So how has that changed? It's changed a lot, but my only, maybe it's my chance, because technically for the immigration law, we are doing something similar. Because so in Turkey, it is also like, even if you will go to the court, you will try to say judge, blah, blah, blah. And they will say, just send me the, you know, the paperwork. Don't, don't talk. But here I know it's different. But for immigration, especially for business immigration, like everything is on the paper. So you, it is very similar to the other cases that I deal with in Turkey. Because technically I have it like a kind of like support letter. It is the main thing in the application. And all other uh, documentation or, you know, the other, um, the proof, you know, the document. So I, I just for this part, I think it's very similar. So you just need to know what is the purpose and you, you need to understand the instructions very well and then, you know, put the documents together. Yeah. And it's worth noting, um, you know, Turkey has its own investor visa uh, program, which has become quite popular with people around the world who would like to go there yeah. and uh, and work or live, et cetera. Um, yeah. you, you have a background in, in now when you when you established your practice in Turkey, I mean, what what fields were you working in at that time? So I was doing like I was doing everything a little bit, but I my main also focus because in Turkey we don't have like a very strict um, fields like here. Like we don't we don't have a, like nobody says for example I only do I am a you know family attorney. Nobody tells that. But in general, because of all the years you know when I was practicing, in time you know uh, most of my clients they were from like. I had some, you know, labor, labor law, uh, you know, I have some, you know, employees cases and I did criminal law as well and uh, real estate law as well. Like, actually, I did almost like everything, but my, uh, you know, like most uh, cases that I worked on, they were on this uh, field. So you you mentioned working with victims of domestic violence. So you did that as part of your, your law practice. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And Yeah, sure. Curious as you know, how would you compare the situation of women and uh, instances of domestic violence? How's that treated in Turkey versus in the U.S.? So uh, when I was uh, at Tiedetepe, we we got some uh, different classes. Like if we compare to other universities, we got different classes such as um, women rights law or human rights law. And so it was because of that I was already train like a little bit about the topic but it was also my you know my my focus i want to also learn more and also istanbul bar is giving special trainings for the attorneys who wants to deal with this type of cases so to get the um, cases from the istanbul bar you have to get this training and also you have to get a certificate they were teaching us besides the you know the laws and besides the law part they were teaching us how to approach this type of victims and how to talk to you know, with them um, or, you know, the um, uh, the um, the other uh, possible uh, options for them. For example, if they they are eligible to get uh, some um, help from the government, like for example, if they need help, I mean, houses. So they were teaching us that who, who should be our contact person when we have a case like that. So it was it was kind of like hard to work on these type of cases, and uh, you know because the subject is already very um, uh, heavy, hard. But uh, when I compare it with here, so and also I want to say something else. So in the past, the law was you know protecting uh, the abused women more. But now also it's changing in Turkey. Um, maybe now it will change again. But yeah, so, but also for here, there are also options for uh, the immigrants if they are, you know, uh, subject for domestic violence or, uh, you know, abuse. But the problem is, for example, they can apply for VAWA cases, but the applications are pending, like the, the waiting time is 
ridiculous. It, it, it is very long, and nobody because of that nobody wants to do because there's no any point if you know they will approve the cases. I don't know, like two years later. So it is very hard. But I believe uh, lots of people also they don't know their rights here as well as a you know immigrant. If even if they cross the border, they don't know if they are eligible for this type of cases. So you mentioned, I want to explore a couple of things because I'm curious. Um, you mentioned that you, the law in Turkey is changing and it sounded like not in a good way or it, it used to be more supportive in the past than it is now. What or it, mm -hmm. did it, Correctly, what happened? Yeah, so there is a law in Turkey. It is protecting, you know, the woman, especially not just women, but especially the abused women. And because it's signed in Istanbul, it is an international agreement. Because it's signed in Istanbul, they call it Istanbul Agreement in everywhere. <laughs> so now, um, you know, I don't know what is the logic behind this, but that now they are trying to, you know, you know, cancel about everything this law Istanbul Agreement, and and now they are kind of like successful. So in the past, you were, you, it was very easy to contact with the uh, police and get a. a for example, some orders for these type of cases, but now it is harder. Nobody wants to touch this type of cases and nobody wants to do anything. I think it's also a little, maybe it's, they are thinking, you know, it's like a family matter. <laughs> they shouldn't, they shouldn't touch or they shouldn't do anything. So. Yeah. And uh, do you see, and have you seen uh, like VAWA cases, I-360 cases? Uh, I did some consultations. Mm -hmm. and, but I am not sure if it is something that, you know, I want to do like all the time because I want to do maybe as a like pro bono in a year, a couple of them. But I don't, it, they are really also hard cases. Like it is hard, very hard to work on Baba cases. I just did some consultations and then try to connect these people to the correct attorneys and correct, you know, uh, organizations. So uh, your, I mean, obviously your main focus is employment-based immigration and investor visas. I mean, how much, how much of that, how much of your practice is the investor and the employment-based? I believe almost like seventy percent. Seventy percent, and the rest mm -hmm. of it would be. The rest of it is mm -hmm, family-based and um, naturalization and uh, like other type of cases like J one, F one. Are you doing any non-immigration cases at the moment? I am also doing like a little bit of like business immigration. I mean, uh, business law, for example, for the companies, uh, for the investors, if they want to set up a company here, sometimes I am, if they don't have, you know, a, a business uh, attorney or if they don't already have account or CPA, I'm also helping them to set up their companies in the States. Like to, I'm helping them to choose the correct type of the company and incorporation I'm, choice mm -hmm. of yeah, and I see. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay, good to know. Good to know. So um, can you discuss, you? You. I, I saw that you have a collaboration with Sirach Law Firm in Turkey, and what's what's that collaboration about, and how mm -hmm. does that enhance your ability to provide guidance yeah. uh, on matters that are related mm -hmm. to Sirach Law is the, you know, the law office also, uh, uh, I, right now I'm also an attorney in Turkey. It is also my office as well. So it is technically, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, I, it is my uh, official address as well. And also we are working together, for example, if I need local uh, help from, uh, you know, the, if I need any document from the course or anything, so we are working together. Or if I need uh, like updated information about uh, some situations, I am connecting with them. Or if they have a, um, you know, if they already have a contact and they are, if they want to do uh, investors visa or if they are interested in coming to the United States. So we are working together. We have um, clients together as well. Are there any issues relating to the difference between the legal systems in Turkey versus in the U.S. that you see causing confusion for the clients? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think there, there, is, there, there are lots of confusions. So uh, first of all, in Turkey, um, when you have an attorney, um, they're, they're thinking attorney is your like best friend and they will, you know, keep your secrets. And but in, the, you know, with immigration, for example, we cannot, they don't understand, we cannot file fraudulent. Yeah. 
Say again. Is is is that just a cultural attitude that they they bring uh, with them? That that's. Uh, I believe so. I believe so. So, yeah, and they have the same urge also here as well. Like they they want to say some like they want to say the things that if I will you know if I know you know there's no any way that I will represent them. So they don't understand this part, and I don't know. Like it is it is I think very hard because in Turkey. It is kind of like custom, like technically you maybe, you know, you might know some things, but still uh, you can represent them. But here it's, diff- especially for immigration law, it is different. So for, I think the main thing is uh, this part. And also they don't, uh, because we only have one system, one unique system. So it means that one unique law system through the whole t- Turkey, but here, there's, you know, states and federal law. So sometimes even, for example, when they want to set up a company in New York, they don't understand. Sometimes also they need to, uh, you know, check the requirements for federal law as well. You know, this is also, I think, very challenging in general for a uh, you know, Turkish citizen. Well, I mean, in Turkey, obviously, each uh, you know city or municipality and and province has some administrative structures. But do you mean to say that, like the law, in in the, the, the virtual? I mean, do you mean to say that the law is going to be exactly the same in Istanbul as it's going to be, let's say, in in Diyarbakir or somewhere in another part of the country? I mean, are there any regional differences in law? Yeah, re- yes, but in for example, for criminal law. We only have one rule book. And for example, if someone will steal in Turkey, they will get the same, you know, punishment if they do it in Diyarbakir as well. But of course, there are some um, little different um, rules, but just for maybe like for small, um, small cities, but it's not like here. So it is completely different. I mean, what do you most enjoy about practicing immigration law and helping individuals achieve their immigration goals? First of all, I'm enjoying a lot working as an immigration attorney because every time, so when I work on a case, it is all different, like different type of um, field for for investors visa. Every time I need to learn from the beginning for some of the area, different area. For example, some sometimes I am researching the restaurants because I, I want to understand the first the business and then I want to, because it is kind of a dream that, uh, you know, we are seeing together and I want the uh, officer see the same dream as well with us for the future. So I am trying to understand the, you know, the whole thing and then I'm trying to explain it. So this is very uh, challenging and also at the same time, it is good. And also I am kind of like part of their dream. I am helping them to to you know to reach their goals and also because I was in the same situation before it is also very fulfilling for me you know to help them to make their dream uh, come true. Now New York has a pretty large Turkish community. Um, are yeah. you are you active in it? Yeah. So in uh, I think New York is one of the New York is one of the uh, biggest populations for the. Turkish uh, citizens, you know, the, the Turkish immigrants. And what's, what's your participation like? Mm-hmm. So uh, we have a Turkish house in the Turkish consulate. Like it's a building for Turkish um, people and for Turkish organizations. They can do some events here. It's also very close. It's on the first street. I'm on the sixth street in the city. So they are organizing lots of events. Some of them, they are organized by the uh, the consulate, you know, the Turkish government, and some of them is organizing by, um, and, you know, the or- other organizations. For example, yesterday, even I attend an event at the consulate. So, you know, it, it is all very good because it gives us, you know, to, it gives me the opportunity to meet with new people and also the, and I'm also, you know, the, young attorney and also they they have a chance to meet meet me so and also there are other organizations that that i am um, attending their events as well new york is very you know uh, popular 
for the, for uh, the Turkish nations because of that. There are lots of organizations, lots of um, non-profit organizations also in New York that uh, established by Turkish people. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's it's very interesting to see it see it develop because I remember, you know, when I first went to Turkey 30 years ago or so, um, you know, there were not that many Turkish people in the United States. Um, there, I mean, there have been a few examples in history of people who became, you know, famous who originally came from Turkey, but not mm-hmm. a lot. It wasn't a country of that gave us a lot of immigrants until recent years. I would say the last probably 15 or so years, I think the number of people immigrating from Turkey yeah. to the United States has increased a lot. Do you agree? Definitely, I'm agreeing with you. And also, I believe another reason is the social media. Now, because it, in the past, I think it was a kind of like a very hard dream for, you know, for Turkish people to even to move to the United States. But now, lots of people there, are, you know, doing like, even at the airport, they are starting streaming. So they are starting and other people there, oh, it seems like it's easy. And also they are sharing their experiences. And sometimes they are, you know, for some of them, it, it is really easy to come to the United States. I think it's also another reason now, because they can imagine, they can dream about it. Like in the past, I think the Europe, especially Germany was like the main, um, you know, uh, country for the Turkish people, you know, when they want to change the country. But now I think it is United States. Okay. And how do you envision the future of immigration from Turkey to the U.S.? Do you think this this trend will continue? Yes. Uh, Do you think there's anything that could happen that would change it? I think the trend will continue uh, because if something will change, if the uh, the law of like immigration law in the states will change, I think it still will not affect the people who has money and who who wants to invest to the United States, because even with you know in the the Trump area, it was the same for the investors. Like we we didn't see any changes in the for the investors visa in the past. So I think it will not change this part, but it might maybe um, affect the people who is already in the States without a status, like the Turkish nationals who doesn't have any status. Maybe it might affect them. And for the situations in general with the consulate, with the waiting time, I don't know what will happen. Hopefully it will change too. Because after COVID, it is it is getting... Now it's kind of like better. But in the past, in 15 days, we were eligible to set up an interview date for applications for the visa interviews. But now, sometimes it is more than a year. So hopefully this will also change. If it it will change, I believe we will see more people will apply for also this type of, especially for the investors' visas. Yeah. Yeah. The backlog of appointments is just a problem globally. That's yes. Yes. That's just a problem. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's been a fascinating discussion. I've really enjoyed talking to you. We're going to stick around in just a minute and do a a short uh, segment in Turkish language for your Turkish audience. But I really appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. I've definitely enjoyed uh, talking about Turkish immigration to the United States. Thank Thank you. you, James. Again, next time on Immigration Uncovered. And if you want to hear the Turkish language segment, stick in. Herkese merhaba. Docket-wise, göçmenlik yazılımı tarafından üretilen Immigration Uncovered, yani göçmenlik açığı çıkarıldı. Podcastine hoş geldiniz. Ben James Pittman. Bugünkü programımızın ana bölümünde avukat Emine Şahin Karakaşlıoğlu ile İngilizce bir röportaj gerçekleştirdik. Şimdi özel konuk profili kısmını sunacağız. Bu bölümü Türkçe konuşan izleyicilerimiz için gerçekleştireceğiz. Dosyalar yapıyorum. Bunun yanında çok fazla olmamakla birlikte aile temelli dosyalar da yapıyorum. Ofisleriniz nerede bulunuyor ve uzaktan veya çevrim içi hizmetler sunuyor musunuz? Evet, ofisim New York'ta bulunuyor. Ama hem ofisten ben görüşmelerimi yapıyorum hem de aynı zamanda e, virtually ya da telefonla da dünyanın her yerindeki Amerika'da göçmenlik hukuku alanında hizmet vermek, e, hizmet almak isteyen insanlara yardımcı olabiliyorum. 
Dolayısıyla ofislerimiz aslında her yerde olmuş oluyor ve aynı zamanda e, İstanbul'da da bir kontak ofisimiz var. E, bazen müvekkillerimizin e, direkt e, asıl evrakları vermesi gereken durumlarda oradaki ofisimize gidiyorlar. Oradan ulaşmaya çalışıyorlar, o şekilde ulaşıyorlar. Diğer türlü de her şeyi bana elektronik olarak gönderebiliyorlar. Bununla ilgili zaten softwarelerimiz, her şeyimiz hazır. Uzaktan kendi dosyalarına bağlanıp bakabiliyorlar. Dolayısıyla yani hem bu işi ben burada fiziken yapıyorum hem de aynı zamanda Amerika'nın 50 eyaletinde çalışabildiğim için bunu diğer kanallarla da telefonla ya da videoyla da yapabiliyorum. Teşekkür ederim. Hangi hukuk alanlarında uzmanlaşıyorsunuz ve bu alanlarda belirli bir uzmanlığınız veya odaklanmanız var mı? Evet, özellikle benim uzmanlaştığım alan e, göçmenlik hukuku içinde e, iş, işçi ve işveren kaynaklı göçmenlik hukuku. Bunun da içinde özellikle yatırımcı dosyalarında e, çok fazla odaklı olarak çalışıyorum. Bunun içinde e, E1 ticaretçi vizesi var, E2 yatırımcı vizesi. Aynı şekilde yine e, e, uluslararası çalışan işçilerin ve yöneticilerin e, transferini sağlayan L1 vizesi de var. E, bunlardan farklı olarak tabii ki yine daha farklı yetenek vizeleri, e, O1 vizeleri ve diğer e, işveren sponsorluğu ile yapılan e, green card e, kalıcı oturum sağlayan green card başvuruları da yapıyorum ama e, en çok odaklandığım benim de buraya gelmeme vesile olan E2 vizesi ve onunla birlikte bahsettiğim E1 ve L1 vizeleri. Teşekkür ederim. Uh, hukuki uh, hizmetlerin ise ilgili duyan potansiyel müşteriler sizi nasıl iletişime geçebilirler? Ee, öncelikle bizim bir web sitemiz var. Oradan bize e, bu numaralarımızdan ya da web sayfamızdaki e, e-mail adreslerinden ulaşabilirler. Bunun dışında ben aynı zamanda şu anda sosyal medya üzerinden bilgilendirici videolar yapıyorum. Bunları farklı platformlarda da paylaşıyorum. Aynı zamanda oradan yorum yazarak da ulaşabilirler. Direkt e, web sayfamızda bulunan direkt e, WhatsApp numaramız var. Oradan da yazabilirler ya da arayabilirler. E, ofis telefonumuzdan ulaşabilirler. Yani bize şu anda teknolojinin izin verdiği her kanaldan çok rahat bir şekilde ulaşabilirler. Bugün programımıza katıldığınız için çok teşekkür ederiz Emine Hanım. Rica ederim. Ben çok teşekkür ederim. Çok naziksiniz.